da da and we are about to be live. Give me one second. Sure. All right, we're live. So perfect. We're live on YouTube. We will be uh, ask we will be answering YouTube chats. So there could be some YouTube chats coming in and depending on the quality of the chat is if I'm going to ask you the question, okay? So All right, let's do it. We're live on YouTube. If you're on YouTube and you're watching and you have a question, leave it in the comments and we we'll we will be answering YouTube chat. The crazy thing about YouTube is they destroy you. Um, I was doing a podcast. Uh, I've been there. So I had Grant Cardone on my show and I was on Grant Cardone's show and I got destroyed, but that's okay. I'm here for that. <laughs> yes. So I just realized this <laughs> the other day, like I was doing a podcast with um, a specific guest. They were calling me peanut head. And oh, I well, like, I got called fat and ugly. So let's go. <laughs> I'm just like, what? Like who? Who do you think these people are sitting behind these screens, like calling people names? Because like Joe Rogan made a specific comment. He's like, you don't see Michael Jordan leaving YouTube comments. Yeah, because he wouldn't do it because he's worth so much money that he doesn't care what people think of him and neither do I. So it's yeah, irrelevant. So, so let's get let's dive deep. I am sitting with Melissa. Melissa, can you please tell me your last name? Kervacek. Kervacek. Is that Russian? Nope, it's Czech. Czech. Czech, Czech, like Czechoslovakia, if I'm pronouncing Czech that Republic. right? Czech Republic, yes. Czech correct. Republic, okay, perfect. I didn't want to butcher your last name. It's okay. <laughs> but I recently named this podcast Conversations with One Percenters, and I was doing some research on your website, and you are a one percenter. Yeah, I literally named one of my companies the One Percent Firm. <laughs> so, we yes. are with the One Percenters. Always, Yes. That's why we get destroyed as well. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah. So I scale, buy, and sell companies. It's as simple as that. I've been doing it for 18 years. Any companies in any industry is primarily blue collar, uh, but also e-com. So a start from you know scaling them and then creating an exit strategy and then eventually selling them off to either private equity firms or individuals. And how's, how's that going? I mean, I've been doing it 18 years, so pretty good. Nice. Uh, what made you get into that? I'm just kind of curious. Like, I, I'm generally curious because, like, for someone to get to that level, it's, it's, it takes a lot of a dedication. It takes a lot of sacrifice and dedication. So I want to kind of get into your story of, like, how you started. Um, I started in jail. <laughs> Damn, so okay. I, <laughs> yeah, so I wrote... Um, my business plan in jail, which was actually a non-for-profit business plan. The problem with living in a small town is you actually need to have a plan to get out of the town to be successful. So mm. I grew up in Fort Atkinson, Iowa. It's a town of 347 people. Consider it like a village. Everybody fits on the same plane. <laughs> um, but basically, my concept was that I wanted to leave and find something better. So my dad was a failed entrepreneur. My grandpa was a failed entrepreneur. And five generations have been trying to be successful entrepreneurs. And it just never happened. So I was the first one to break free in my family of those chains. First one to become a millionaire. First one to travel to 35 countries, speak multiple languages, have like just a very blessed life. And um, so... I got out of jail and my thing was like success loves speed. So just worry about execution. So I started executing. And one of the things that I did was, and I don't recommend that people do this is like, tell my dad to fuck off. Like whatever your opinion is, Damn. whatever your mindset is, whatever like you think is relevant is not like I'm doing my own thing over here on my own road. And every day I would wake up and work in the living room of my parents' house. And my parents have been married 40 years. Um, and I'm the oldest child. So my siblings were still going to school. And like, I was working from their living room. And I would just be like, just leave me alone. I'm just gonna figure this thing out. And ironically, like back then, 18 years ago, YouTube wasn't a thing. Correct. So like we, like I learned on YouTube, what very little was on YouTube. So like Les Brown, Tony Robbins, Deepak Chopra, um, those ones. And I built a little company and then eventually my clients, Natalie and Lee came and said like, can we buy the company from you? And I ended up selling it. And then I just repeated that same process. 
for myself and clients. And it's been an amazing journey since. But I would say that success does not love speed. It loves accuracy. So try to use the data and analytics that you have to make decisions that are in your best interest, not on speed, but on accuracy. Well, somebody uh, that is a counterintuitive because there's a lot of people out there. I think uh, one, Grant Cardone says speed. Two, yep. Andrew, Andrew Tate says speed. So from your data, why why do you say to not focus on speed more than the data? Well, you need the data to create like the speed. So I'm not saying don't like be okay. super speedy, but at the same time, like you're not trying to make the wrong decisions because you're just trying to make a decision. Like you need to make these decisions on the basis of the data and analytics that you have however long that takes you to evaluate, then you can make the decision. Got it. So you said you created all this from jail. That's, that's really interesting. What was that like? What was jail like in Iowa? No, no, no. What was it like trying to focus on creating a business inside of a jail? Like, were you isolated? Were you with like a... Oh yeah. Well, I was only there for seven days. So it wasn't like, it wasn't like a long time. And it was only because I refused to follow the law. Like I thought for whatever reason I was exempt from the law. It did not apply to me. (laughs) It's that like entrepreneur mindset. So I got 26 speeding tickets and that was, yeah, that was the whole like reason why and then they put me on sr22 and i didn't have sr22 because i didn't have money to have sr22 so i got caught with driving without a license driving without insurance and then this is like how you get to learn a lesson at a very young age you must drive fast cars i own a lambo yes i do (laughs) what what, what color is the lambo white white nice Uh, um for the longest time growing up when I was like 18, 19, my biggest thing was to own a Lambo. Mm-hmm. To, the reason to start a business was to own a Lambo. Now that you have the Lambo, like has your like, pers- I don't know if that was your plan or your idea or the main, uh, the main uh, striving factor for your, for your business. But like, what's it one, what's it like having a Lambo? And two, like, what was your reason for getting into this entrepreneur space? Like, why not just go get a job and work a normal job? Yeah, no, thanks. That's not for me. That will never be for me. I don't care about that. (laughs) Like, that's the whole thing of like, five generations have already tried this thing, and it didn't work out for them. So someone is going to have to step up and be that person that breaks the chains. Like, we're not going to be poor people our whole lives. We're not going to populate the city, city, like our whole lives. We're not going to like, say that we're not capable or that we don't have the tools or resources when they're available to us. Um, and so just taking this very hardcore stance, I guess, was the thing that made me choose this different pathway. Um, but as far as owning Lambo, I think it's really amazing because I use it as a tool. Um, and I let kids in it. I let dogs in it. I take it to the children's hospital to fulfill the last dying wishes of children who have cancer or terminal illness or something like that, um, for the make a wish foundation. Like I'm very intentional about showing people like what is possible coming from nothing, having nothing, not having the right mindset, the right money, the right environment, (laughs) anything like that. Yeah. Do you find it, do you find it like hard to connect with people? Cause some people might look at you and be like very jealous of you. You know what I mean? They're like, she's got the Lambo. She's got all this. I don't have this. And like, do you find it maybe hard to connect with some people on that? Like, I mean, the people that I'm supposed to connect with, I have a really amazing relationship with. I think the thing is you're right in saying that people look at the Lambo and they're like, Oh my God, like she's above us. Right. She's the 1% where I'm like, inviting you into the conversation like here you want to take a photo in the car we can do that right here in this chick-fil-a parking lot like hey you want like to how do far do you live from austin texas i'm gonna need a test drive in this thing <laughs> orlando florida <laughs> damn so i'll be there only... <laughs> tomorrow yeah so it's a, it's a big deal to like allow people to dream and fulfill visions and get a bigger picture of what is possible for them no, that is very true. Vision is the biggest thing, I believe. Um, with that yeah. being said, I, I want to know more about like what what you're actually doing. In I mean, you don't have to go into too too much detail, but like what like when it comes to your business, you're buying businesses. We scale, buy, and sell, so okay. a combination so, of all three. 
so for instance, you're going, you're going to do you like pre look at the businesses or do people like call you? Like how, how does that process go? Yeah. So let's talk about from the selling side. So like you decide that you want to sell your business. I would require 17 different things to verify that the business is legit. There is actual financials and it is a sellable business. Um, and so I guess what makes me different from a brokerage is that brokerages typically get 6%, whereas I don't. I take a flat fee one time in cash up front via wire transfer. Um, so I don't do equity. I don't do buyouts. I don't do anything like that. Uh, but instead what I do is like, I'll ask like, what is the purpose of selling the business? So like giving two vastly different scenarios, one might be that they want to retire. Another might be, um, which was a recent scenario where a wife was in a domestic violence situation and she needed to remove herself from that state, but the business was like a physical location. So she couldn't do that as easily as say an e-com business. So understanding like why they want to sell the business um p ls taxes leases or real estate um a list of equipment um and then providing an evaluation giving a multiple on that business so like solar would be a multiple of 35 typical blue collar would be 4.5 this is <laughs> these multiples when i say that like don't take this with a grain of salt because like every business is entirely different and every okay. business's multiple is determined on their net of their taxes. So if your taxes are like negative 100,000, but you're actually making 4.5 million, which is the case I've dealt with recently, there's a big difference in what the multiple is going to be. So um, all of that on the sell side, um, including due diligence, um, uh, NDA, which is a non-disclosure agreement. And some of these terms, like I'm very loosely saying, because a lot yes, of people don't know what they mean. So it's very like, I need to tone it down a lot for people to understand that there's a lot of stuff that goes into deciding whether you should sell a business, why you should sell the business and how you should sell the business. Um, Even me being knowledgeable, I'm like some of these, some of the stuff you said, I'm like, damn, I've <laughs> got a lot of learning to do still. Yeah, I mean, like, that's the whole thing is like, not a lot of people are familiar with the term. So just, you know, making sure that uh, how I communicate is clear and understandable to the vast majority of people, including the one percenters. So you're still doing this, correct? How long do you how, do, how long do you see yourself doing this for? I don't know, you... however long I love it. I'm passionate okay. about it. I wake up every day like, what's the next business we can talk about? What's the next problem we can solve? What's the next owner we can help? How can we like adjust people's lifestyles and provide opportunities and make more money? And like, that's what life is all about. Does this, because uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, they suffer with like what's called shiny object syndrome. They're going to go mm -hmm. to the next business idea, the next business idea. I'm one of those to where I'm like, if I see something, I'm like, I want to do that. So does this, does the fact that you're like, like helping multiple businesses and buying them and like, it's kind of like flipping, right? Kind of. Yes. So I would does equate that, it. Does to... that help with like shiny object syndrome? Because it's like something <laughs> I, new. It's an elevated version of shiny object elevated. syndrome, which <laughs> takes a lot of time and a lot of money, but it's, yeah, it's very worth it. Yeah. I'm just curious. Cause like, like I said, that's one thing that I know for sure that I struggle with and i've been getting better every time yeah and, and trying to be trying to be more focused and stuff like that so i think this comes from spending a lot of time on social media mm. and the reality of that is that you have to be very conscious of how you're spending your time whether it's on social media because you're getting educated or whether it's on television because you love drama and whatever like dumb shows <laughs> or series or whatever so like in December of 2023, I decided to become super intentional about my time. And okay. the way that I did that is I actually, and this is very extreme, so this is not going to be for a lot of people because I'm an extremist when it comes to figuring out how to hack life in terms of being more efficient and being more productive, but also just making it more enjoyable to spend time with loved ones and family and travel and all that kind of stuff. So I removed all televisions from my house. I sold my laptop. I sold my iPad. I got rid of the internet. 
And so like, I'm literally doing this for my phone. And the the fact of the matter is like, a lot of people can't live that lifestyle. And they're very lost. Like, what are you doing with all your time now that you don't have these devices? Mm -hmm. It's glorious. I walk my dog, I spend time in nature, I go biking, I go to the gym, like, I have so much more time. And I think Andrew Tate would agree, like, you don't need to be around these vices. Um, It's the same as drugs, it's the same as alcohol, it's the same as all of these other things, but they're just things that are easily accessible and always available and in front of everybody's faces all the time, every day. Have you ever found yourself deleting social media and then re-downloading, re-downloading it again, like a couple of weeks later? No, like, I don't do have feel, do social that media urge? on my phone. No? No, um, but no. only because I dealt with that issue like five years ago. So um, when I did my largest sale, um, which was around 27 million, I literally decided like no more social media. So you'll find me on Facebook, but that's the only platform you're going to find me on. I'm not on LinkedIn, Twitter, anything else. Like that's not a thing for me. But before, like I was worried about how many followers do I have? Like how many times a day can I post? Like how many things can I interact with? And it was like a very big, big addiction that sucked a lot of energy and life out of me. And so I don't suggest people deal with these things like as a whole all at once, but as like divide them up. So like, obviously it's taken me five years to get to where I'm at today in terms of like dealing with these addictive behaviors and personality traits and ADHD and ADD and all the things that we all deal with. (laughs) But yeah. No, I'm with you. I'm trying I've been trying to do the same thing. The biggest uh, thing for me, I would say is social media, like the biggest like time sucking toxic yep. thing it would be social media like i've tried to to delete all the apps but for some reason like i need to post a post and then next thing you know i have the app on for another few months okay so take the apps off your phone like just delete them entirely off your phone so that's one extra step that you have to do is you have to go to a browser now okay so once you get to the stage of like you actually have to go to a browser then spend like a week or you know, two months, whatever it takes to get mentally prepared to take the next step, which is the step that I'm at. And you have to log into the browser. And then on Friday, you just X out of it. Like you literally just close out of your social media on Friday. Don't worry about it. It's not that you're not working. You could still be working, but you're not logging in to see who's commenting or how you can interact or how addictive all of these things can be. But I've also seen it where like people intentionally put time for social media inside of their schedule. So one of my friends runs a very successful um, shoe company doing custom shoes. Um, And they literally put from like 8.30 to 10 p.m. every night in their schedule as like TikTok time. Mm. (laughs) And it's fine. Like that's what makes them happy. That's what makes them enjoy life a little bit more. And that's that's one way to deal with it. So you have to deal with it. However, makes the most sense for you. Got it. So I, I got a question. This might be too personal. You can, an- you can answer it. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. One second. I'm open to answering. I think pretty yeah, much this anything. Might be too personal. You can answer it if you want to. Are <laughs> would you consider yourself or are you a millionaire? Yes, I am. Mm-hmm. And another question is, so, most people think that once you become a millionaire, your life is going to be like, oh, let's go to the beach. Let's we could do you could do whatever you want. So why is a multimillionaire getting rid of TV, getting so, rid of social media and locking in even more than the average person? Because they're very dedicated to their craft and they're very intentional about their time and they're very effective on the strategies that they use to multiply their wealth, which is the whole point of becoming an entrepreneur to begin with. Why not just, I mean, you've already made the millions. I'm, I'm just asking this in general curiosity. Why not just uh, sell the business and, and live a happy life and have fun? Why not just have fun for the rest of your what life? Is, what is a happy life and why can't you have fun when you do both? Like I do both and I have a lot of fun. I, everything is very intentional, right? Um, and so it's not about like, how can you have less fun? You definitely want to have more fun, but in having more fun, that requires being around people that doesn't require being isolated or away from society. So I think that there's a time to build, but then I think that there's a time to build with other people. And so mm. I'm just at the point okay. where like 
partnerships matter, people I spend time with matter, like the energy I'm around matters. So it's not like, how can I spend time on my website or spend time on email campaigns or Facebook ads or stuff like that? It's like, no, how can I spend time in private jets on yachts, like living a very luxurious life that's different and directed at a very like different type of person, I guess. So yeah, just being intentional about it, but not giving up on the whole purpose that you started with. The purpose will change as you grow older and as you mature and as you make more money, but like the desire never goes away. It only increases. Got you. Yeah. I was just genuinely, genuinely curious on that question. Cause I know like the norm is like, Hey, go, go to work, go home, watch TV, play some video games, eat some dinner, go to bed and repeat the cycle over and over. So it's yeah. always a general question is like, cause most people think once you make it, you're, you're done. You can just, you can just stop. You know what I mean? Or that's like so, the goal. Yeah. I talk about this a lot. So entrepreneurship depression is a real thing. So let's say that you sell your business because this has happened to me. Mm-hmm. Um, when you have your business, right. You have like this very directive schedule, like your, your calendar is filled with things that occupy your time during the day. And then like you sell the business and then what? Like, and then what are you going to do? Go to the beach and sit there for like how many months? Like, that's going to get boring. Go read books. Like, but how many books are you going to read before you're like, I don't want to read books every day. Like what you want to watch movies. And then like you watch how many movies and you're like, I'm bored of watching movies and sitting on my ass all day. Like I want to be more active mentally and physically because that's what exhausts me. And that's the thing that makes me like wake up every day and go to bed tired at night and like have peace of mind and security and stability. And those are the things that matter. Yeah, I always find myself just flipping through the like the previews of the movie on Netflix, but I'll never actually like actually click a movie. It's weird. Mm-hmm. It's a weird uh, thing that I do. Yeah, but uh, that's because you don't have the attention span to watch the movie. Yeah, that's probably what it is, hundred percent. So I'm big. I'm big on like time management too. So I've I've tried to do everything that I can to yeah. lock in on time management. I don't. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. You most likely are. You might have like a different terminology for it, but we all have like what's called 100 units of time. I don't know if you ever heard of that. Nope, I haven't. So, no. so basically no. within a week, you have 100 units. And so I think that breaks down to like 14 hours per day that you can use to do whatever you want. You could watch TV, you could grow a business, you can work a job, you can hang out with friends, go on dates. Like you have 100 units. And the biggest struggle for me, I would say, when it comes to like time management is one, I'm working a job. Two, I'm trying to build a business, but also trying to manage a relationship at the same time. And there's just not enough time in the day. Uh, have you found any productivity hacks? So like maybe even in the beginning of your business to where you're just like, okay, this works for me. If someone sticks to this, they can actually have a better chance of succeeding. Okay. So I think that having a relationship and being involved in your family and having faith and having time to go to the gym and having time to read and all of that is, is really important. But I think that there's also times where like, if you're in the beginning of building a business, like you just need to set your head down and forget about like having extra time for all of these things that need your attention. Once you figure out the business and once you get to a certain point in the business financially, then you can say, okay, the business isn't as important as it is. I don't need to spend as much time as I was. And I can go dedicate myself to these other things that are equally as important. So I don't think at any time you're going to be giving any one of these things equal attention Mm. you're going to give the thing that needs the most attention the attention that it needs when it needs it and vice versa so like if your family is going on a vacation you're going to obviously go with them have fun whatever put your devices down not work not be doing podcasts and stuff like that where uh, like if you're in the startup phase like your head is down you're not going on vacation you're not going to your child's musical whatever like it's just not a thing so you just have to decide like this is important now and this is the reason why and this is my dedicated time to that but what happens whenever the things start to break that's what i call them break you know what i mean if you feel the tension you're like okay this part of my life is like i'm feeling the tension over here or this part's over here i'm focused 100 percent on business or like 90 percent on business um then I got the job and stuff like that. Like, do you only give the attention to it when it starts to break or are you like trying to balance it before then? 
Well, I think it's starting to break because something internally inside of you like is focused on the outcome and focused on the stress. And so you're imploding your own self, you're self-destructing. Um, and these behaviors become repetitive and build up over time to the degree that it's not that you don't have time. It's not that you can't make time. It's not that you don't want to prioritize. You do, but you don't know how. And you don't know how because you're putting these invisible timelines on yourself. So uh, like what a lot of people do is like, okay, I have to have a child by or like I have to feel this extra pressure because this deadline doesn't exist, but I now made it exist. So I need to get this report done by Monday or like I need to make this call by next week or if I don't close this deal, then my whole life is going to p- fall apart. So yep. remove these invisible timelines from your life and you'll feel a lot less internal pressure and combustion and you won't self explode or like defeat the purpose of spending time on other activities so that they're not falling apart. Got it. And that leads me to my next like topic is a uh, goal setting. Uh, mm-hmm. The way I set goals might be not, might be, different from the way other people set goals, but I'm more like, okay, I want to make 30 K a month or I want to make 50 K a month or I want to make like a hundred K a month or a million a year. Like how, how did you go about goal setting when, in, in terms of like reaching your goal and becoming a millionaire? Um, so honestly, it's not a, it's not about goal setting. And I know that sounds so ridiculous, but it's not. So like one of my first properties, like my very, very first property, I bought that house because I saw it on Facebook marketplace and it was priced for 47,500. And immediately Mm. I was like, okay, I can afford 47,500. What I didn't take into account, of course, this is where the speed (laughs) trap comes into like account, but like, I didn't take into account that there was like 152 code violations and this thing would cost me 160,000 in rehab. So in my mind, I was just like, okay, 47,500. That's like easy money. I have that. (laughs) Um, so you have to be like consciously making decisions. So like, I don't know if I would say start with something that aggressive, but Mm -hmm. that's like who I am personality wise. And so Start maybe with something that you can manage. So my first piece of land that I ever bought was 39000 I sold it for 90000 Like you could flip land, you can flip houses, you can flip a lot of things. Uh, but start with where you are with what you have and what, what you can reasonably do in a certain period of time. So I think a lot of people underestimate the amount of money and underestimate the amount of time that it's going to take to reach a goal. But then they set this expectation, this deadline that doesn't even exist in their head as something that they need to achieve. So um, once I had that property under my belt, I put tenants in it and it like paid for another property. And I just kept this compounding effect going until eventually I had six homes um, that were occupied where tenants were paying and I was making money off of those while my business was also making money, but I was tax sheltering um, through real estate as the investment vehicle. Um, and obviously like you can choose whatever, but at the point that you're making this type of money, you need to tax shelter. Um, and so I think it's a conversation that comes up randomly when you reach that pinnacle, I guess, in your career. Um, and so I don't think I went out with the intention of like, I'm going to own a Lambo. I, I actually think what happened was I listened to work bitch too many times and that like ingrained in my head subconsciously that I need to own this Lambo and need to have a hot body and a Maserati and all these things. And that's just what happened. Like I chose to listen to these things. And as a result, I have what I have. What what would you say was the key turning point? Like that moment there, you're like, stuff really started to take off for you. Uh, I was in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was sitting on the couch at an Airbnb, and it was Valentine's Day, and I was like, okay, let me go to Facebook Marketplace and see what's up. And there was this house, and it was an all or nothing deal. And of course, like on Valentine's Day, everybody is occupied with their significant other Um, But I actually asked the Airbnb host if he would be open and willing to help me uh, unload this house, like literally just take all the furniture out of it. And I would just, I don't know. I don't know what my plan was exactly. But the the whole thing was like, it was all or nothing. And I was all in. (laughs) 
So I tell the guy, like, listen, I'm going to be there at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning with a U-Haul truck and a crew. Don't worry about it. I didn't have a crew or a U-Haul truck. <laughs> so, so I'm like, dude, it's 10 p.m. And I got to figure this out. So I asked Eric, the Airbnb host, I'm like, you want to come with me tomorrow? Like, I'll pay you a hundred bucks. Like, just drive the U-Haul truck. We're going to go down to this property. I'm going to buy everything in it. And then I guess I'm going to get a storage unit. I ended up getting two trucks. Eric brought a few of his friends and I got four storage units because that's how much it took. While I am directing the moving company of where to put this stuff that I'm buying. Yeah. Uh, Eric is in the kitchen talking to one of the biggest Airbnb hosts in Atlanta. And he's like, do you know who Melissa is? And then he's like, just Google her. Here's her credentials. And I'm like, whatever. Like, I don't even care. I'm throwing blankets in the living room. Like, I'm, I'm talking to the movers. Like, my mind is so oblivious to the conversation that they're having. So DJ, who's the owner of the home in Atlanta, he's like, I got this buddy and he really needs help. And like, you should call him and tell him that I send you and I'll tell him that you're going to call him. So the next day I was at their house having a conversation in their living room. And um, for five months, it was radio silence. Like nothing was happening. He wouldn't give me a call back, like whatever. That ended up becoming uh, a $600,000 a year deal for me. So I took wow. it on. As a cons- yes. Holy so, shit. <laughs> do your life. Don't worry about anything. Just be yourself, live in your environment and just keep going. And people will recognize that. And like, even if there's silence, don't worry about it. Cause things are happening behind the scenes that you don't know anything about with people. You don't know who are connected though. You don't know who. Yeah. This, and, this sounds like, uh, the, the Grant Cardone when he quit, like his similar, uh, yeah. and I want to get into that shortly, but I want to kind of still stay on this topic where uh he did that show where he he basically left his family left everything and started from yeah. scratch mm-hmm. so it, it, it sounds similar to that i want and i do want to jump into that once we're done with this topic because i do want to get your feedback on that okay but no so you about- started so you're saying you started your business more in real estate no, I started consulting and then I okay. made so much money in consulting that I had to Got tax it. shelter and real estate was the option that I chose to use as the way to tax shelter. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. I was yeah. thinking you were buying these houses. Yeah, I was buying these houses. Oh, you're cash. buying them. Okay. Yeah. Not, and, and then flipping them or? Um, some of them have tenants and then okay. some of them I flipped and then some of the land I kept and some of it I built on, some is commercial, um, all that kind of stuff. Does it take a does it take a lot of money? Because uh, when people think of real estate, they think I need to be pretty much a millionaire to start buying real estate. And I started with forty seven thousand five hundred, so that's that's going to be false. You can start, but the thing is, like, you are going to start in a really dirty neighborhood. Like, mm. all my carpet got robbed. Damn. <laughs> all kinds of shit happened. That's the reality. You're not going to go be investing 47,500 and thinking you're going to end up in the nice neighborhood. You're going to be in the ghetto. You could be shot up. You could be robbed. You could be, uh, you know, contractor quits or write some nasty shit on your siding. I've had that happen. It is what it is. Just... They always say the bigger the risk, the bigger the reward. A hundred percent, but so... know what you're getting into before you get into it. I mean, yeah, it, it all sounds like, like you said, your first business, I think you said this in your first business, you like, you got in before you actually realized everything that it really took. I always do that. That's yeah. the thing with me. <laughs> but I've done that too. I've bought like, I I tried to start a bounce house business and had the bright idea to start that business. And then next thing you know, I'm like, holy fuck. Now I need a truck. Now I need right. uh, a storage unit. Now I need insurance for this stuff. And that stuff's not cheap. Now I need, uh, I know for sure I need marketing website. Like I did not think everything through and that ended up costing me $10,000 because I stopped doing it because that was definitely something that I was not ready to do. Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of waste of money. That's okay. We chalk them up as lessons learned. I learned a lot of valuable lessons. You could also lose some relationships. Don't hire your um, significant other. That's a big one. So 
Um, I dated this guy for four years. And then at the end of the flip, the $47,000 house, I was like, so like, I'm really exhausted. I can't finish this house. This is too much of a burden. Like I'm ready to burn this house down to the ground. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> and um, he's like, no, I'll handle it. I'll handle it. Just give me your credit card and give me um, oh, a certain amount of money. And I was like, yep, here you go. Wired him out the money. I gave him the credit card and I was like, have a good time. <laughs> like I'm out. But then at the end, like that cost me my entire relationship of four years. So I think it's really important for you to Lord. estimate like what is the consequence of making that type of decision? Because you are inevitably going to lose money, you're going to lose relationships, and you could lose time. And I mean, you could lose all three, but sometimes it's worth that. How would you, how do you handle like just, um, are you in a relationship right now? Curious. <laughs> no. Okay. But when you are in a relationship, how do you handle like the, your conversations? Because I'm sure your mind's all on business. You know what I mean? Like business, 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 business. Uh, how do you uh, handle? No. No? No? I know when to check out and when to be present. So okay. I think one I don't know of the how to do that. Things... That's my problem. So I'm always just like business. I need to do this or what am I doing on business? And that's all my conversations are. And they, so I know for sure I can sense it. She don't say nothing, but the girl I'm dating, I can sense that like, she's like wants to have better can conversations. Can you please dial it down? Yeah. 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 That, so that's tough. Right. So like you have to learn how to be very present. So one of the things that I do is like, I will just shut my phone off. Like I'm just mm. not available. Like I'm not answering texts. I'm not answering calls. I'm not going on social media. Like I am with you 100% of the time and I am fully present to engage. Like, so last night I had somebody over, like, I know this person very well. I've known the him for a long time. And, like, we were up till 5 a.m. This is not something that I normally partake in, but this is a once-in-a-year thing, I guess. And so, like, we just had a really genuinely good time. Like, we had pizza. We had drinks. Like, we, like, sat and listened to music. We had good conversation. Like, and we were fully present the entire time. And, like, you know, that's when we realized it was now 5 a.m. <laughs> so, it's, like, the more present you can be, the more enjoyable it is. So that a lot about a lot about being present is just one for sure getting rid of your phone because I feel like that if you have your phone you're gonna just be checking and you're not really there. 100%. Yeah, you're disengaged 100. percent Yeah, and that's why you see um, David Goggins when he does all these interviews he literally shuts his phone off like he doesn't have it there. He's like I am here with you. That's it. But mm. also like when I am in my workout I'm in my workout like no one's allowed to be in that space. And so he dictates his space. And I think that's why he's superhuman because he's very like, whatever I am doing, I'm giving it 100%. And that's one of the tactics that I love about David Goggins and his performance and his, you know, superhumanness is that he is like, look, I'm here with you. That is it. I'm not doing anything else. And it's the same like during this interview, like I'm not going to be checking anything else one because I can't because I'm using the device to do this interview. But like two, because I think it's just, it gives you like better insight into who I am and it allows us to have a deeper connection that hopefully carries on beyond this interview. Um, yes. And I think that's super valuable. No, that is very valuable. I, I, however, do have my phone out, so I'm not David Goggins yet because I'm looking at comments and also a little bit of notes that I have taken down. So but that, yeah. I, I do see where that can really, I want to get good, very good to where one day I don't have to use my notes ever again. Um, no, I love that. I want to get more into your grant. I, I'm a big fan of Grant Cardone. David Goggins, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to lie. I know a little bit about him. He's a superhuman guy. He does a lot of stuff. He's yeah. he, but I don't like know too, too much about him. But one person I do know a lot about is Grant Cardone. And okay. so you said you had him on your, on your, you did a podcast with him. I did. Yeah. How was that? And like, what was, um, what was the reason for it? Like, what, what was the reason for the podcast? So I've known Grant for years, years, like, um, before he moved from California to Florida. So when he was like a baby, just starting off his little company, which is now mm. a mega company. Um, but like, obviously he did the, the show, um, and he hired Jordan. Um, and obviously they had a very big breakaway. The Jordan, same Stupar, with his Jordan Stupar. Yeah. Okay. Jordan's I know the show. Really it was a uh, 
Uh, yeah, I, I don't it remember that. <laughs> it was like a Young Hustlers type show, or like a. Yes. So that name of that show, like Grant and I, like he Facetimed me, and we were talking back and forth about what to name the show. So my show at the time was called Millionaire's Hot Seat, and he didn't have a name for Young Hustlers. Like he didn't have a name for anything. He was, yeah. you know, coming up. <laughs> um, and so like I was on Young Hustlers. Um, I was on his other show, like, uh, I didn't do the 10 X events. Like that's not really my thing, but, um, yeah, like I, he was on my show and then I was on his show. Um, rags to riches was the name of the one. And then I'm not sure what he named the other ones, but, um, that's the primary one that I remember that I got like bullied or whatever we're calling yeah. YouTube people that beat you up. <laughs> There's some bullies on YouTube. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> Trust me. They don't, they don't cut no slack. Yeah, no, it's okay. So that's the thing is like, you know, Grant and I are having this fantastic conversation and the commentary is like, obviously like, who do you think you are to be able to have a conversation with Grant? And my question to them is like, I mean, honestly, which one of us is speaking with Grant, you or me? Like, you can sit here and bully me all day long. The fact yeah. of the matter is, like, I am here present with Grant having this conversation, as I am with a lot of other people. Um, but you, on the other hand, are in this negative mindset and this incapability to believe that you are valuable and so valuable that you can sit with the best of the best wherever they are in the world. Um and I haven't talked to Grant for some years now, but like, you know, and the beginning of his company and all the way up until like he put assets under management, we were, you know, talking pretty regularly. So I think it's just really important that people recognize you can connect with whoever you want to just doing a podcast like this. And I did that for five years. And that's how I met a lot of the relationships that I have today. Nice. Would you say that has a direct indication to your net worth? Like your network is your net worth? Hundred percent, yes. That's I would say my I would say my biggest weakness. But back in the day, my network was net. My network even today is like more just like people I work with, bartenders and stuff like that. So never really had like a super massive network. And I hope that this podcast can, like you said, build on build upon that because you. I believe you just have to offer value to people. And yeah, I'm still 100%. trying to I'm still trying to figure out how this podcast can be valuable to people, but if I can help share their message and get them out there more and at least even if they just get one deal from the podcast and they sell a super high ticket product, they can it's worth it. But why do they have to sell a deal to be valuable? Like you and I just having a conversation is valuable okay. enough where we don't have to sell anything to make uh, each other's lives enhanced now or in the future. So I never take the premise of I'm coming on a show to sell anything. That's not the purpose okay. of going on a show. It's to build a relationship with the, the person, get to know them, have a conversation. And then eventually like it'll pan out down the road that we do something together or maybe not, but at least we'll have had some interaction um, before doing business or before getting a referral or before selling anything. Got it. Yeah. So I'll, I guess I looked at the podcast. So you, um, you did podcasting. So it's it's good. I'm I can talk to you about this. I looked at podcasting as a way to because um, I wanted to offer value. You know what I mean? Like the way I guess my perception of the value was like the only reason people are going to take me seriously is if I can get them a customer. Because right now I'm not going to lie. Oh. I'm a, I'm a I'm not I'm not anyone special. I'm like I'm special, but like I'm not anyone special to someone who's doing multi millions of dollars per year. So, well, is that true? Because I'm on your show. So that's bullshit. Yeah, I know. And I'm surprised you're on my show. I'm like, that's, I'm just saying my thinking. <laughs> my, Let's my, crack this problem right now. So Marcus, yes, that is my complete thinking. and utter bullshit. Let's like going forward today. Okay. You don't have to think that you're invaluable or that just because somebody doesn't make a sale that makes you less than it. Like you are valuable because you asked for whatever for me to be on this podcast or for anybody else to be on the podcast they agreed and committed time to spend with you because they value the relationship and as a result like you get to do the thing that you love you get to learn and get educated and then you get to also as a result share with other people on the internet Got it. Yeah. So when I was when I was building this the guy I was learning from he said that the your podcast should benefit your guests that that's what they said like 
your podcast needs to benefit who you're talking to. It needs to be all of like all about them, which I agree. And and, and he, he did say about re, like building a relationship and stuff like that. Like the pod, the goal of a podcast is to build a relationship. Yes. Yeah. I do firmly agree with that. But he also said that like, uh, well, I guess I don't know if he said it or I just made it up in my head or whatever. You but probably I, made the <laughs> shit up in your head. <laughs> it's a thing. Like but, if your girlfriend wants you to be present, you got to start dumping this crap out of your head. Like you came up with this belief. You came up with this timeline. You came up with the like, no, that's irrelevant. That's not okay. Yeah, so I came up with the, the, I guess I came up with the, in my head that in order for a multimillionaire, I'm, we're talking about like the Sam Ovens, the Grant Cardones, the Dan Henrys, you specifically as well, to mm-hmm. take me seriously, someone who is not a multimillionaire, to take me seriously, I need to like get you customers. Like that's the only way that I feel like to provide value for you. Cause like I'm thinking, why would they want to come on the show and just talk to me? That's what I'm thinking. Like this is what's going through my head. I'm just being so if they honest. don't want to do that, then we would just say no, because we say no all day, every day. That's a, like a word that we are very familiar with and we have no problem using and we give no explanations and we provide no apologies. So it'd just be a straight up. No, we're not going to do that. You'd be like, no, I don't want to come on your show. Have yeah. Like you asked me three times, like, are you sure? Like, are you coming? Like, yep. Yep. Yeah. And the funny thing is like, I was actually like, Marcos, you don't need to ask me. I've already committed myself. I already know what time this is going to be. I already know that I have to set aside like this is your time with me that's it like this is what we're doing i still have a lot of limiting beliefs i'm still working on so please please bear with that's me. actually awesome that this is live and that we can work through this like in a format that allows other people to see that it's just not like a thing that they're struggling with but you're struggling with i come up with my own beliefs like and so all of us have a struggle in some capacity regardless of the level of success that we have yeah, I would say like my belief is more of like, I guess I look at like people who are doing um, very, very well or like doing millions of dollars and driving Lambos and Ferraris as, as like you would, you, you would look at them more. And I'm not, I'm sure I'm not the only one who does this, but you look at them further ahead and then like you got to just do this like super immaculate thing to get their attention to like want them to, to talk to you. That makes sense. Yeah, you mean asking them the question, can you be on my podcast? That's not a super immaculate thing. <sighs> to me, no, I don't think so. Like, personally, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I don't, I just don't see it. I don't know. It's just me. It's something I'm gonna work through. Um, Starting with your next guest? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to work through before the next guest. Hopefully, hopefully we settle this, like get the settled no, there's right now. No, hopefully there's no, hopefully we're doing it or we're not doing it. So which one is it going to be? We're doing it. All get right. Then let's right commit now. to doing that. So now my value to you is going to be accountability. And I'm going to make damn sure that you actually follow through and commit to what you say you're going to be going to do here. Oh, I will hundred percent. I'm going to make sure by asking you. Got it. All right. Whew, that was deep. That was good. That was very good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is the whole point of these conversations. So back when I did my show, like I too, I didn't have any money. Like I was doing this, you know, as much as I could do it. So my show was called the millionaires hot seat. And for five years, every week I would interview millionaires and I had the same sort of belief systems, but at the end, like I curated my show so that I wouldn't disclose how much the individual was worth. And I had verified that each individual was worth X amount of millions. Okay. But I had said like 10 questions, 30 minutes, welcome to the millionaires hot seat where we put the pressure on millionaires to get their best, you know, kept secrets, questions, all that kind of stuff. And so then we would just dive into like, the 10 questions and at the end like those 10 questions were more about me breaking through barriers Mm. and about me being able to figure out how to make money and Mm. about me being able to get a different lifestyle it was all about me 100 percent. but not one of them was like i'm not going to contribute to you or i'm not going to have a relationship with you or i'm not going to give you advice for free or i'm not going to spend time with you like all of them committed to that and all of that made me who I am today. And I'm super grateful for each one of those individuals. So how do I make money? <laughs> it depends. Yeah, yeah. I'm like thinking like, how do I make money? You're, you're the, you are the expert. So um, I'm run, I, right now, right now I'm running a, a marketing agency, but I'm working a job. And I would say my biggest struggle with that is my, is uh, not the fact that I don't have good time management. Cause I think I'm, got a lot better at cracking down on time management. Yeah. I would just say, I don't know it. Like, I don't know what I need to know. 
Like, uh, well, who's your clients? First of all, what kind of marketing? So my you ideal teach? clients are coach, coaches and, and consultants who want to scale with advertising, who they already have their funnels. They already have their systems in place and they need someone who's going to specifically work on their marketing and scale them with paid advertising. Okay. So you do Facebook ads. Yeah. Well, Facebook is like what we start with, but we want, we will eventually diverse because you don't want to have like a one legged stool. You know what I mean? You don't, you don't want to just but have Facebook. Facebook is what you have. Yes. Okay. And who's the we? You mean you? Me, but I'm also uh, work with a partner as well. I have like a, a bit like he's not my partner, but he's someone that if I am too busy, I can refer deals to. We're all in this. Uh, we're all in this inner circle. So we are all tied into this inner circle um, with a guy named Jeremy Haynes. So we are all in, in mm -hmm. like his program. We're all learning from him. He works with top mentors. And even I'm like, man, how does he do this? Because I'm like, I've, I feel like I've done everything that I can to try to like get to his level, but I'm like falling short every single time. I'm just falling short, falling well, short. Well, okay, hold up now. How long have you been in business? All right, so I'm going to be real. I started my business in 2017. I did not listen 100%. I started taking on deals that were, they were just cheap deals. You know what I mean? It's the people paying $500 for me to run to get them huge results with Facebook. But I was still yeah. taking these taking these deals on. And then when COVID hit, I didn't have enough money to, I, I lasted to 2020. I had mm -hmm. about 15 to 20 clients just doing like three to $500 deals. It yeah. was a lot of work. Um, but when COVID hit, I never, I never, never was able to make enough money to sustain, to survive COVID. Then my relationship ended and I quit that. And like, I stopped that or my old relationship at the time back in 2020, COVID actually uncovered all like who you're dating type stuff. <laughs> So I realized oh, the person I was dating wasn't for me, moved to Austin, Texas, and was like, I need a job. Mm -hmm. And my goal was to work the job only for six months. And that turned out to be a job that I worked for now three years because I uh, started, started working as a bartender, then started consuming alcohol and drinking alcohol, then was partying more, then lost the business. And then for the last 15 months I've locked in. I've not drank a single drop of alcohol. I've been locked in on my business and pushing forward. Although I've been like shiny objects here and there syndrome. I was recently on uh, Dan Henry. Do you know who he is? Mm -hmm. I was recently on his business roast. It hasn't list hasn't like dropped yet, but he roasted me and it was like, yo, you need to like lock in. Like you're doing all this random stuff. He's like, go back to what was working. And so what was working for me was a marketing agency. Okay. And but it was only Facebook ads. So is it really an agency or you're just spe a specialist in Facebook ads? Well, I, think you should I do want to get to the full agency. I do want to get to the full agency. Forget about that. Like, forget about that. It doesn't matter. Like, you don't need to call yourself an agency if you're just Facebook ads. You can okay. be Facebook ads and you can be profitable and you can be successful and you can be a millionaire just on Facebook ads. Um, David Schloss is a great great person to connect with when it comes to that because he started the same way that you started um and so so you run facebook ads and who's your demographic coaches and consultants who no, are no <laughs> that's like that's not enough like you need to be very very specific like what age bracket what industry how much are they making how much are they spending how much are they committing to in a contract is it a six month agreement or are you just letting them month to month all of that stuff actually matters because that's the difference between falling short and being ultra successful i thought i was well first i specifically want to work with coaches i know you're going to say this but i want to work with coaches and consultants who are doing 50k per month or more in their business is that so do that okay so today you're committed to doing that so anybody that falls less or short of having fifty thousand dollars, they they don't qualify. That's that's not a client. It's not a client. You don't need that money. That's not your ideal fit. That's not somebody that's going to pay you well. That's not somebody that's going to get you out of this job, and it doesn't support your lifestyle. So that's that's the proximity that you're choosing now. Got it. The title of no, but like you got to do that now. It's not got it and say got it. It's like no, tomorrow you're not taking any clients that don't have less than fifty thousand. Like that's the deal. 
you can't just keep being the yes man. I know that's that's hard for me. I have like that is that is hard for me. And I'm not even trying to roast you. I'm actually yeah. No, roast me. Dinner. I've already got roasted before. I'm down. I'm down to get roasted. <laughs> Multi-millionaire roasts me during her podcast and completely destroys my business model. I'm not destroying. No, 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 no. I'm locking it in so that you can have the Lamborghini. You can have the business full time. You can have the lifestyle that you aspire to have that brought you to Austin, Texas, to begin with. Um. So those are, if those are the things that are important, then figuring out how to get those things is more important. Yeah. I would say my first goal is to just get out of the job. You know what I mean? Like if once I can do that, then I can really lock in, but that job really consumes like your, your time, your focus and all your energy. And if I'm, okay. like I said, if I'm going after baby clients, it's going to take me like 20 clients just to even try to leave the job. So you can just tell those 20 clients, no, I have a yeah, yeah, yeah. W2 job that pays me well. You. And then I take on two really high-end clients and then I don't have this W-2 job, but I have extra money and I have peace of mind and I sleep at night and I don't worry about where my next client is going to come from because these two clients love me so much that they'll refer other clients to me that fit the same criteria that I'm looking for. So if you were going to buy my business, what would you tell me right now? <laughs> There's no business. I know. I know. <laughs> So, no, nope, that's not – first of all, this business isn't scalable the way that you're doing it. So figuring out how to make it scalable is far more important than figuring out how to exit. And that's the hard part with marketing agencies is they really aren't that scalable. You don't have an agency. That's the thing. Well, like, just Mark say it that you have a Facebook ads business. Like, yeah, yeah. I, it's well, very clear what you have. Facebook ads businesses aren't scalable either. Like, Yes, like they are. Do you know who David Schloss is? I don't, but I will be checking him out after this. this okay. Uh, well, his business podcast. is super successful. Um, and he started off just doing Facebook ads and he's scaled it to many individuals working for him. And he's been able to move from Florida to Colorado, have children, get married, all that, that because of Facebook ads. Just a specific uh, Facebook ads agency mm -hmm. or like business. I say agency, but. That's just the term that's in my stuck in my head. I know. That's because that's what you want. Yes. And you can have that, just not right now. So the reason I want what I want is so we're like the whole terminology. We mentioned Andrew Tate earlier, but he does talk yeah. a lot about the matrix. Mm -hmm. you're familiar with the matrix <laughs> yep not the movie <laughs> the actual yeah. the, the matrix the lifestyle that people get stuck in and they work jobs and they never actually do anything and they're stuck pretty much the way he describes it as slaves we're just modern yeah. day modern day slaves working for a house and food yeah that's what 99 percent of america is doing right now what is your best advice for people to escape the matrix? We're just going to call the term the matrix right now, but there could be other terms, but like, what would be your best advice? Like maybe, maybe it's like five habits they need to do, or maybe they need a different mindset. Like me, we just talked about my mindset and obviously I still need to work on my mindset and beliefs and stuff like that. Like what would you say that people need to do to, to escape? The biggest thing that people need to do to escape is borrow somebody else's confidence that has more confidence than them. So right now, because you don't have the level of confidence that you need to be successful at a Facebook ads agency and you're starting this podcast called the 1%, even though you're not the 1%. No, it's not for uh, me. That's the, the podcast isn't for me. It's for the people I'm conversating with. So conversations <laughs> with one percenters. Right. But the thing is that, okay. In order to escape the matrix, you need to borrow the confidence from the people that you have on the show. Got it. And so by borrowing this confidence, you're going to talk different. You're going to walk different. You're going to act different. You're going to believe different. You're going to go to different environments. You're going to be around different energy. You're going to invest in different things. And all of those things will eventually elevate your confidence so that like you can be on this show and talk as confidently as I am about my career or, or my lifestyle or whatever. 
Like I talk very quickly and I talk very confidently because that's the kind of thing that I know that I bring value to other people in. And so I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't have great mentors and I didn't borrow this confidence from other people. Um, because like before I just, I wouldn't love myself. Like I wouldn't care about myself. I wouldn't trust myself. I wouldn't do all of these things. And I was basically a walking time bomb of self-destruction. I've been there. It's, I've been, yeah, I've been there. So um, I think it's just really important that you find somebody that can help you elevate yourself until you're ready to elevate other people. Borrow, borrow, like, Hmm. Okay. Any specific habits? Drink water. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I didn't drink so water stupid. for the longest time. Yeah. I said this on another podcast that I did. Um, and they were like, what's the number one habit that helped you break eight figures? And I was like, drink water. Like, I know this sounds so ridiculous, but if you fill your body with, like, your body with sugar filled substances, mm. Like you don't get the clarity, you don't get the sleep, you don't get the hydration, you don't, you like have brain fog, you're always tired, you're like feeling lethargic, all of the things, you shouldn't be drinking energy drinks, try to cut the sugar down and get to water and figure out how, like this sounds stupid, but like, um, I forgot the guy's name, his name, his first name's Alex. Hormozy? No, he's in Becker? Texas though. Austin, Texas. Alex, Alex Becker? Mm-mm. no nope alex sold his company for 110 million um shoot but anyway i took a water drinking class from him so i literally had to learn how to drink water kind of forcefully because i didn't enjoy it like i don't like water i don't like the taste of it i think it's mm-hmm. boring i don't want to force myself i don't like to go pee all the things <laughs> At the end of I the day. I hate water. I'm not going to lie. I'm drinking it right now, but I literally, I'd rather be drinking a Dr. Pepper or, or a Red Bull, like to be real. Same, same. Okay. Same. That's the thing. It's like, you don't have to like something to do it. You have to do something to like it. Like that's just the way it is. So if you want clarity and you want sleep and you want healthy habits and you want, uh, you know, all the things that you want, you have to drink water. Like your skin will love you. Like you will just, be much more productive you mentioned brain fog yeah i want to talk about that because i i still currently do like i've i've got my diet better because like before it was red bulls it was energy drinks from uh other energy drinks dr pepper and Mm c4 i don't know if you know what c4 is but that is an energy drink from the gym so that was my diet i would wake up go grab a breakfast taco grab a dr pepper eat lunch, finish more Dr. Pepper. Then I would also like, it was bad. Eventually I had an anxiety attack and I had to stop drinking those, which has probably benefited my life like tremendously because Mm -hmm. entrepreneur, it got worse as I moved into the entrepreneur space. And I was like, I need to go, 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 go. And the only reason I, the only way I can go, 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 go is if I'm like energy, 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 energy. But it, it almost cost me a lot, especially my health. And now all I drink is water and maybe some, some juice here and there just to get like flavored stuff. But, Mm -hmm. but the the other thing I haven't really, like the other thing I want to get better on is like a better diet. Cause like you talked about brain fog and stuff like that. And I do believe that's a thing. And if you're eating the wrong foods, you're not going to be as productive. So like, what would you say like that is for you? So this is also stupid, but like I watched this, I fully immersed myself. I watched this um two hour documentary on youtube called dominion it's horrible just know that if you're gonna go watch dominion it's terrible it will change your life but it's terrible (laughs) um and it basically is where they are like mass murdering animals and it's very vivid and very bad (laughs) so after this I basically decided like, okay, I'm not going to eat meat. And it's not like I don't, I grew up in Iowa on the farm. That is what we ate. That is what we lived by. That is a thing, right? So I'm not condoning meat. I'm not saying eat it. I'm not saying don't eat it. What I am saying though, is that when I cut out meat and sugar and caffeine, 
I felt like a fucking superhuman. I felt so good. Like I did not know that the reason that I was taking naps in the afternoon was because of meat. Mm. Like I did not understand that the reason that I had so much inflammation was because of meat. Like I did not understand that the reason I had to get massages every week because like I felt um, like my, I could feel like certain ways in my body um, were like making my joints tough or like my back hurt or like whatever yeah. was because of me like as soon as I cut that out I was like oh my god I feel awesome but on the flip side of that it was I have to say like honestly it was a mental thing so it was like I watched this movie and then mentally I was like I cannot partake in mead so let me start like eating vegetables which I never ate vegetables that was never a thing like I don't like them <laughs> same. so it's like same <sighs> You got to like learn to like different foods to feel better. And once you have that feel better, like the clarity that you have and like the less brain fog and no naps and stuff like that, that will continue to drive you to maybe not enjoy the meals, but the purpose of the meals isn't to enjoy them. Like you don't ever hear Andrew Tate saying, oh, I love cauliflower. No, he doesn't say that. <laughs> He says, you, he says, we need to suffer, especially as men. He's like, you need to, he even invented a new pre-workout and it tastes like shit <laughs> because well, I've heard plenty it shouldn't of, be about taste. Uh, I got to disagree on the pre-workout thing. It should <laughs> always be about taste. Like my pre-workout that I always take, it, it changed formulas because it got sold and I immediately stopped buying it because I was like, no this shit is not for me <laughs> but um keeping that consistency like if you like a certain pre-workout then certainly do that if you like a certain protein then certainly take that like but try to be as healthy as you can and mitigate as much substance abuse as you can and substance abuse meaning like addictive behaviors like sugar or mm. weed some people default to that or whatever you're addicted to and you'll know what you're addicted to whether you want to honestly be open and say that or not and so for me like it was always pepsi and red bull like that was just the default like that was the thing so i had to forcefully drink water and yeah i mean it is what it is yeah it's hard but i guess the biggest thing for me is i had to like have something happen to me and hopefully people can change before that because it's better to not have that happen versus yeah. have it happen um, what do you like? I would I would say like I'm trying to think. What do I eat right now that's bad? What I eat right now that's bad is maybe I'll have a few candy bars. I know that for mm -hmm. sure that's bad, and I know that cereal. So like my my breakfast is like cereal. It probably can be better because apparently you're not supposed to be even drinking dairy. That I researched. Yeah, well, I'm allergic to that, so that's not a thing for me. But, um. I think the thing that you just said that probably makes the most sense to me, like what kind of a uh, cereal do you eat? Uh, Cheerios or I'm not going to lie. I eat Cheerios or um, what's the other one? Uh, cinnamon toast crunch. Yeah. So, so immediately like, so breakfast means to break fast, right? So that's the whole meaning of the word break fast. So if you break fast and you immediately put sugar in your body, which is exactly what Cheerios is, mm -hmm. then you're, crunch. yeah, then you're creating chemical reactions in your hormones, which immediately send your brain into a shock. And that is what is causing the brain fog to carry throughout the day. So if you're going to break fast, you should break fast with like perhaps eggs or feta cheese or something that has substantially less sugar in it so you're not flooding your hormones and getting the brain fog the minute that you wake up it's constant work people think entrepreneurship is all about like the business but you also got to focus on like <laughs> no. the eating and the time management and like what else i'm probably what else do you what else besides like eating and time management do you feel like is like key factors? relationships relationships for sure yeah, hundred percent faith. God, number one, always like that's a you know that's yep. a thing for me. I don't go to a church, but I'm one hundred percent about faith based actions. Did you grow uh, up? Uh, did you grow up in church? 
Yes. Uh, very, very from? Catholic. A hundred percent. Yep. Super Catholic, Catholic school, Catholic, all the thing. Yep. Why from someone growing up in church? Cause I'm the same way too. I grew up in church. I, my mom pretty much forced me and my brothers to go to church every single time <laughs> that it opened Mon- Sunday, Wednesday, Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. So how come you don't <laughs> go like anymore? You said you don't go. Yeah, I don't go. Yeah, I don't go because I feel like the church can be anywhere you are, but you have Mm. the church in you. So like for me, part of that is like, you know, taking the taking the Lambert of the Children's Hospital and fulfilling their their last wishes like that's a godly behavior. Um, You know, you can read books to the kids and help them get educated. And that's a godly behavior showing people what's possible possible is a godly behavior like you need to do things with the intent of being godly and or um following whatever religion it is that you follow and doing so without the expectation of returning anything like so if you're giving a hundred dollars to a stranger like the expectation is that you're not going to reap a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars you are giving one hundred dollars away and that's a gift Mm, no okay Cause I guess the notion is like, if you don't go to church, you're not, you're not like. Godly. Yeah. Godly. Yeah. There we go. You're not godly. You know what I mean? You're not going to church. You're not like, you're not in the presence of God. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I don't obviously want to get into a whole religious debacle because this will get me murdered on YouTube. <laughs> but, but the thing here about church is that like, you give a lot of money to the church, right? And as a result of giving all the money to the church, then you have stuff where churches are falling apart because they're uh, molesting or because they're taking the money and buying private jets or they're living in these mansions or whatever. Like none of these things are godly behaviors. So like smaller churches, maybe I could support that. Larger conglomerates that are for profit corporations i'm pretty anti that and so like the messages that these pastors populate isn't biblical based it's based on the desire to become wealthy and Mm. pocket money and i i can't buy that how how do my my main question was how do you keep like you said, so you said how you keep the faith, but do you do it. Do you like pray in the morning or do you like, mm-hmm. okay, yep, 100%, like that? Right. Yeah. prayer every day, Bible every day, like do good things every day, regardless if other people see them or don't see them, um, have conversations surrounding God on the back of my Lambo. I put plates like, um, in God, I trust, like, I'm just not quiet about it. So just be loud, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, we won't get too deep in the 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 religion topics. I don't know what we'll get. What well, what's more worse, talking about Andrew Tate or the religion? Oh uh, well, we're we're gonna find out. We we will find out. <laughs> well, we are at uh, an hour already, hour and twelve minutes. I know, I saw that. That was a that was good. I think the best conversations come e- even after the podcast, like after it's done. It's like mm-hmm. you can have some really good uh, conversations. Well, you also get the intakes and outtakes. So like if those happen to be on video, then you can just chop them up and put them in. Yes. So I don't know if, um, I feel like we're done. I know there's a lot more we can dive into. We don't have any questions, Marcos. This is amazing. Wait, no, so I think YouTube started freezing. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Like, you, oh, dang, you, like no questions. This is incredible. <laughs> no, people were saying, people said, uh, for instance, one guy said, she's, she's literally so knowledgeable, inspiring, kind, and wonderful. Oh. Love the podcast. Keep them up. One guy said hi, but I think YouTube uh, kept freezing because my, my phone kept freezing as I was playing. You know and... what that is? That that right there, that is a sign that you should put your phone down and be fully present. Do you believe in signs from the universe telling you yes. what to do? I was fully present. Yeah. My phone was down. My phone was down. No, no, no. You were like, hey, I have this phone issue. <laughs> And the universe is like, yes, let me help you re like instate this belief. Yes. Here I do like go. that. I'm going to freeze your YouTube. And now. But my notion with the podcast is I feel like I have to have like hundreds of questions ready to go. Like I got to have like bulletproof questions ready to go. It's got to be like, if I don't have questions, then you're going to be like, okay, this guy wasn't prepared at all. 
Okay, but the thing about having conversations isn't about having preparedness. When I sit down to have a dinner with my best friend, I'm not like, hey, like, here's 100 questions I'm going to ask you. I'm like, hey, we're just going to dinner. Meet me there. And we're going to yeah. enjoy this dinner. Like, that's, I think, what this podcast is designed to be is like, hey, let's sit down, have a conversation. We're in two different living rooms. But at the end of the day, like, we are sharing this space and this knowledge and being able to exchange energy. And like when I get off, the energy here is great. So I'm going to carry that throughout the rest of the weekend. Let's go. Yeah. So like, Let's that's go. where you find value. It's not like, we, Hey, can I have a hundred pre prepared? Yeah, questions? yeah. So, um, work, work with me real quick on this. A multimillionaire, my, obviously my, uh, the guests I want to bring onto the show are, are, uh, I would say, I wouldn't even say they're multimillionaires. They most likely are, but they're going to be the coaches and consultants who, people who are in the consulting space. Um, yeah. And I guess I just, back to the notion is like, I, my belief is like, it's all like, I got one, I got to be prepared. You know what I mean? I got to have like a list of questions ready to go. Two, mm -hmm. it's got to all be, be all about them. Three, how can I get them customers? So, I guess my question right now, just to, so I can say this in the right question form is how can I format this podcast? Why, like, like why would a coach and consultant who makes $50,000 a month want to be on my podcast? If it's not like solely about them. First of all, that's not a million dollars. That's $600,000 by the way. So we're going to have to increase that number. Okay. Second, you're going to take all the beliefs that you just said and whatever else is in your head and write them down. And after you write them down, you're going to get a lighter and light this piece of paper on fire mm. because those beliefs are no longer part of your belief system. So you've physically discarded these beliefs from your brain by writing them down and burning them. Did you, did you learn that? Have you, did, is, is that a sp specific message you learned somewhere? Yeah, I created this thing myself <laughs> because like I always had certain beliefs. And so the way that I would remove these beliefs is if like if I could physically get rid of them. But when they're in your mind, it's really difficult to physically get rid of them. So mm. if you can visually watch something burn, <clears throat> then in your mind, you're discarding that from your system and you're reprogramming your, your system to have additional beliefs that serve you better. So once these beliefs become um, obsolete or no longer a part of your system, then you're going to just show up as yourself, ask if they want to be involved or not, and they're going to do it regardless of the value. Like never once did I ask you, what is the purpose of the show? What are the questions nope. of the show? Like five minutes before the show, you were like, can you send me a headshot? And I was like, yeah, here you go. Like it was never about selling anything or anything of that nature. It literally was about, I'm willing to show up for you, Marcos. And that's the commitment that I've made. And whatever we discuss is an open conversation. Got it. Like I said, I'm new to this podcast. I did. I, I started podcasting back in 2017 and I did three videos. So my, I'm that was the old version of me. I got a new version of me that is not that same person anymore. And there are going to be over 52 podcasts this year. So um appreciate that so let's make those great podcasts by removing these belief systems starting like tonight you could do this little yeah, exercise like, yeah i'm gonna write all these down get a match burn it yeah you should get a lighter though not a match so the flame in the fire is bigger okay well it's It'll going to be burn. more impactful <laughs> yeah it's going to burn something's burning tonight hopefully it's not my house <laughs> hopefully <laughs> i'll be doing these podcasts outside uh, you mentioned <laughs> something about my podcast name. I'm curious about that because I this is about conversations with one percenters. You think that's mm -hmm. misleading since I'm not a one percenter? Nope, it's not. Okay. Uh, it's not misleading. I'm. I think you need to probably. And I ran across this myself as somebody that called their company the one percent firm. Is like, what is the one percent? So when people ask that question, like you're going to have to have a definition ready to go. So what is your definition of? the 1% because clearly you're saying millionaire or multimillionaire, but then you're also saying 50,000 a month, which well, doesn't 
I think sixty thousand dollars, six hundred thousand dollars a month. What, what, like not a month. A year. Sixty thousand equals about six hundred thousand dollars a month, which puts them in a one percent tax bracket. Okay, so you're going by one percent as tax bracket. Yes, but I'm also like, that's my ideal customer. But I'm, it's more of like they're they got the mindset and they're trying to do better, and that I feel like makes them a one percenter. Like they're maybe they're not a one percent like earner today, but they are working to be in 1%. Okay. So that's your definition of the 1%. Yes. Okay. And that's it. Like, so it's not really the 1%. It's just a premise of how to be 1% better, I guess. Mm, okay. It might change. <laughs> we'll see. No, leave it as it is. Like, okay. I, so when I ask people, like, what is the 1%, a lot of times it's like, okay, do you have a million liquid in mm. cash or do you have a million in assets or do you have a million dollar um, tax bill or like, what does the million represent or what is the 1%? But the fact of the matter is 600,000 is still the 1%. The average person in America today, and I actually just looked this up last night, makes $59,304.72. So... I'm below average right now. I better step the, it up. The the one percent technically is anything above four hundred thousand. Okay. Okay. So I don't think that you're having conversations with the wrong people. I think that you're having difficulty understanding who your customer is and speaking to them in a way that makes them find you valuable and then mm. clothing the deal. So that's the biggest thing that you need to work on and change is your messaging to your audience and it not being so broad. It has to be very specific. Uh, can you give me an example? Yeah. So like when I called my company, the 1% firm, I was literally in very intentional about like, you have to have a successful business. You have to have a business that has cash flow. You have to have cash in the bank. You have to have a team already in place. You mm. need to be able to pay me X amount of dollars per month up front. I actually have policies in place that I don't take credit cards. I only take wire transfers. So if you don't have the cash, we are not working together. Like, that's oh, just shit. part of the deal. Yeah, no, I don't take credit cards. It's not a thing. So your commitment to me is that you're able to wire the funds over and you've already gone to the bank to wire the funds. So you've double verified via a signed agreement with myself and uh, basically a signed agreement with the banker upon the wire transfer that you are fully committed to this process and will not ask for a refund. So like creating these stipulations, regulations, rules, whatever, call it what you want, um, so that you understand who your audience is and your audience understands, um, what your expectation is. Got it. Okay. I can, I can work on that. I can work on getting that better. Yes. Yeah, so coaches and consultants is not. Yeah. yeah coaches, consultants, but they need to have the, <laughs> they, they need to have a list of like who you're per, like the, if they don't have this, then you can't work with them. You can't work with that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, and if, you if, need to learn no. No is an answer. It's a full sentence. It does not require an explanation. It does not require an apology. It requires nothing. Yeah, if they don't have this, don't take the deal on just because it's a deal. Say, like, you don't have this and move on. Like, that's you it. don't have this, get this fixed. If once you have this fixed, we can work together. Or not. Yeah. Yeah. Great conversation today. I really, I enjoyed it. Awesome, I did as I'm well. I'm going to hit uh, stop real quick. In, okay. And wait, hold on. Let's see. Hopefully it doesn't. And <laughs> hopefully it don't boot us. Hold up. Oh, there we go. Hold up.